We've reported often about how race can affect children's lives, and that minority groups, on average, face worse odds as they grow up. One thing we have not talked much about is whiteness. Now, I'm white, and recently I spoke with another white person, an expert on how white people handle discussions on race and how they often don't. Robin D'Angelo was right out of college when she started thinking about it. She landed a job leading workshops on racism, and she met a man who became very angry. He pounded on a table. He said, white people are the target of discrimination. White people can't even find a job anymore. D'Angelo looked around the office. She saw nothing but white people, all of them with jobs. It was unnerving. It was like, this is not rooted in any racial reality that is happening in this room, in this workplace, or in this man's life. And yet, these feelings are real. His rage is real. How do we do that? How do white people see themselves as the victims of racism when the world around them shows something totally different? D'Angelo worked for years doing racism workshops, wondering this. Eventually, she developed a theory. Just, I started thinking about it, about as how fragile our sensibilities are when it comes to race. She called her theory, White Fragility. She wrote about it in a book called, What Does It Mean to Be White? D'Angelo says, white fragility starts from the moment of birth. Because of our segregation, those of us born white end up seeing mostly white people around us. And once we're old enough to experience culture, we still see mostly white people in children's books, in TV shows. We live in segregated neighborhoods where the white areas of town are inevitably seen as good and the areas where minorities live are bad. Schools are judged the same way. If we just gained our opinions from living our lives, following the trajectories laid out for us in schools and in our families and and in our kind of social interactions, we will necessarily be ignorant about race and racism. But that doesn't stop us from forming opinions, many of them strongly held opinions. And one of the biggest ones is about what racism means and who is racist. The number one most effective adaptation of racism over time is the good-bad binary. This idea that um, a racist is a bad person and a good person is not racist. And that, so it's about individuals who are either good or bad or who either do or don't engage. One of the side effects is that many white people come to believe that if they just don't talk about or think about race, then they are not racist. Then, if someone comes along and talks about racism the way D'Angelo does, that racism is a system of oppression, that anyone can be prejudiced, but in America only white people are racist, and actually all white people are racist because... Racism comes out of our pores as white people. It's the way that we are. Well, hearing this is going to make you upset. Maybe make you feel under attack. Maybe make you pound a table. Almost any defensiveness um, that you get from a white person trying to talk about racism is rooted in that good-bad binary. They hear you saying you are a bad person. The flip side, D'Angelo says, is if you think of yourself as one of the good white people, you think you've got it down. You see the latest person caught on camera using the N-word, and that's what racism is to you. Whatever you're doing isn't racist. And so you don't think about the whiteness of your neighborhood, your school system, or your office. Understanding how racism plays a role in those daily situations takes thought and effort, D'Angelo says. She's been at it for two decades. Here's what she can say today. I'm really confident that I do less damage to people of color than I used to do. That is what I can say to you. And even that, she says, takes daily work. <laughs>